Imagine you were unjustly accused of a crime, you were put in jail for 20 years, and then you found that you were innocent and you were freed. Wow. <laughs> Father Mike Manning, God bless you. Thank you very much for tuning in. We have a very exciting program today, one that I'm sure is going to touch your heart and your soul even. Um, Frankie, thank you very much for coming and being with us. Thank you, Father. You, um, you've just been released out of, from jail. You were in for 20 years, and after 20 years, it was found out that you were innocent, and That's you were true. suddenly found to be free. And here you stand, and, and you've got, you got a certain sense of peace and, and, a, and a sense of vision and empowerment that, that really is astonishing that I wonder if not if I were in your shoes if I wouldn't be filled with all kind of bitterness and anger and, mm -hmm. and just overwhelming frustration at, uh, at what you've lost. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Could you let's get back to the nitty gritty. Sure. You were 16 years old. Um, someone was murdered. That is true. Uh, what, what was the situation? There were six to seven people that that started making accusations against you. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about sure. this, what happened. So the crime occurred in Linwood, California, and uh, where, I, where I resided. Um, Where's that, where? Linwood. Linwood, okay, Southern, Cali so, Southern uh, South California, South of Los Angeles. Right. So what occurred was, um, about a year prior to the crime, is kind of where this all kind of begins, um, a local sheriff snapped my photograph. Random stop, you know, hey, what are you doing? What's just going on? I was just in the local park with one of my friends actually a few of my friends riding our bikes and you know he just wanted to be a cop and do what he does. Um, he snapped a photograph and apparently put it into a, a gang book or some sort of like suspect book. Were you part of a gang? On the fringes of it. You know, fringes, it, it, was, okay. it was a tough neighborhood and sure. you know there I was. Linwood is tough, yes. It's a tough neighborhood so at, at times I felt that you know I was part of it and you know I was, I was a boy you know so what occurred so so January 18th, 1991, I'll fast forward, fast forward to about a year from then, a crime is committed. Um, what was the crime? The crime was a murder. It was, it was, so it was a drive-by murder. Um, it, it occurred on January 18th at 7 p.m. Um, it turns out that a group of African Americans were out in front of their home just being boys. They ranged from the age of like 16 to 18. And uh, it was a Friday night, they were just having a good time. When a car drove by, um, said something, said some words to these guys, kept driving, and when it got to about four or five houses down the, the, the road, the guy who was sitting in the passenger seat fired back at the group and missed the guys who was, he was aiming at and, and shot a man by the name of Donald Sarpy who was um, on his porch pretty much. So it, it's a tragic case. It, it's, um, it's, it's, it you know, breaks my heart to know that this man, an innocent bystander, was anyone was, was fired at, but the fact that an innocent bystander um, was injured and, and, and oftentimes these innocent are, are little children that are in the exactly. house innocently playing around and suddenly exactly. they're killed by And in this case he was a 43 year old um, father and husband and a great man from what I hear. So it just made it that much worse. Wow. So, so what happened soon after was that um, the investigation began and one of the witnesses were t was taken to the sheriff's department and shown photographs and so as it turns out now it's uh, with recent testimony that occurred just nine months ago, um, the witness is now saying, along with other witnesses, that they were coerced into selecting my photograph. So a whole bunch of photographs were put up together from this photograph a year before. Right. And they're looking at that and they say, oh, this was the guy that was in the car that shot the, the, the did the right, shooting. Right, right. Although it was 400 yards away. Are you saying that right? Exactly. And, and p, uh, 7 p.m., so it's a, it was pretty dark. It was, it was, it was, there was no light out. It was dark. So it was, it was a case that was, was hard to identify to begin with, but um, from what it turns out, there was just some either bad police work or just some funny business going on. So, so, so one person identifies you, but right. then it turns out there are more people that come to exactly. identify you. So because of that identification, they gave, it, it gave the Sheriff's Department um, ammunition to arrest me. 
Um, I was arrested. I was I was um, you know interviewed. I, where I were you? Where were you at the at the so time of the crime? By this time, we had moved to Maywood, which is maybe 20 minutes uh, north of Linwood, and you know I was home. I was I was I was a high school student. Lived with my father, brother. Um, I was in bed. I was literally in bed when the cops came knocking on my door, and hauled me away. Wow. Yeah. And so, but there were more people that came up and started to make, making the accusations. Am I correct? So what occurred was, so that one witness was enough to arrest me, but it turns out in order for them to take me to trial, there needed to be more because at that point, that's all there was was one guy saying I was the one. Yes. There was no physical evidence. There was there was there was nothing other than this guy's voice, his word, you know, his identification. It turns out that um, the district attorney, the sheriff's department, someone had figured that there needed to be more if this was going to go to trial. So they went back and found five of the witnesses who, who corroborated the story. And six months after the crime, they were shown that same photographic lineup, and, and they all selected my photograph. Wow. And it turns out now that the first guy um, influenced the rest of them. You know, it's, at some point, it, 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 gets, it gets very sketchy and, and unfortunate. It gets very unfortunate that, um, you know, in order to, you know, appease the sheriffs or, or to, you know. Get rid of them, too. Yeah, yeah, to do their part. They just say, okay, tell me who to pick, and I'll just pick them. Or, oh, Frank, t t yeah. tell me a little bit about what's going on in your head at this time and in your heart and then your soul. Those are the three things that sure. I'm concerned about. What, what, what's going on? All of a sudden, you're pulled out of bed right. and you're taken to jail. For something you didn't do, you know it was, it was very hard. My dad was very confused, and so was I. You know, I'm 16, and my father was just you know, abruptly awakened. You know, doors kicked down, and and you know, a good 15 sheriffs coming with you know armed. 15. It was it was an army of them, and um, literally, I thought they had they're at the wrong place. You know, my dad was confused, I was confused, and um, both afraid. You know, here's here's pistols being pointed at us, talking about don't move, get on the floor. And at that point, all you can do is just lay there. Comply. Absolutely. Course. You're taken to jail, and this case gets more and more difficult because the, you're, you're hearing more people are confirming the fact that you were there even though you were not there. Right. Tell me a little bit about the fear that must have gone in your heart and the right. anger and the confusion. Can you put words into, into what was going on in your heart? You, clearly, I knew this. I wasn't the one. So that gave me a lot of strength, just personally. I knew that this was a mistake. My, my thing was that be, maybe just being naive, or just being maybe just being, you know, I'm not sure what the word is there, but I believed in the system. I believed in the judicial system that some, this, this case would come a, uh, upon someone who would review it, and they would realize that this is a mistake. And obviously that, that didn't happen. Um, so what was occurring was, was a lot of confusion. Um, I was tried as an adult soon after. So it went from you know being tried as a juvenile with with the juvenile system, and I was tossed into an adult environment with um, you know me being the 16 year old boy amongst these professionals, and I was a fly on the wall pretty much. You know I wasn't I wasn't up to speed on what was going on with the procedures. Wow. There was no life references that I can kind of base what was occurring on. So I was I was the main you know star of the show, but I knew nothing that was going on. You um, you go to trial. And then all of a sudden, uh, the trial, you, you probably were picking up from the trial that things were going, going sour. What right. happens when the jury comes back and says, you're guilty of murder? Right. And what was the sentence that you were, you were given? So the sentence was 30 years to life plus life. So in California, that pretty much means a death sentence. 30 years to life to life. Right. Thank you. What, what went on in your heart when that, that moment came? Your, the system failed you, if you will. Right, right. Everything has fallen apart. Tell me, what, uh, what's going right. on in your heart? So, so what occurred was, so I had two jury trials. The first trial hung. Um, the jury was not able to um, come to a conclusion. So it was seven not guilty, five guilty. And soon after, the second trial began, and um, that's where they found me guilty. And I could not believe that this was going on. I could not believe that this was the outcome. Um, I, th I think I, I, I emotionally just shut down. I was, I was not able to, to even comprehend what was occurring. So I, I can I, imagine that. I, I, yeah. I'm just sitting here listening to the story <laughs> and it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming yeah. to have that. So right away, 
you're put into juvenile ju juvie hall, is that right? So, so you, you mentioned before that right. you've gone through every aspect of uh, the penal system in California. Right. Tell us a little bit sure. about that. Sure, so, so I was 16 years old, so at, at, because of my age, I was put in juvenile hall. So I went from Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall to Central Juvenile Hall, which I spent most of my time there, roughly about two years. And on my 18th birthday, I was transferred to the L.A. County Jail, which Juvenile, is typical. Juvenile, let's uh, tell me about sure. Juvie, Juvie Hall. What, how, many, how many are you with? What, what, are you living in a dormitory? Uh, who are some of the people that you're living with? Right. So in Juvenile Hall, was, I was, it was a cell living. So I lived with another guy. So there's two, two, two young boys per cell. And it, it, was, it was a different awakening. You know, it was, it was a place where I had, um, like you mentioned earlier, just I had, I'd, life had stopped. And there was time to reflect and, and time to you know analyze not just what was going on with this case that was, you know, thrusted on me that I knew anything about, but also just reflecting on myself and and kind of just um, realizing that this is a unique experience all by itself to be able to just um, be taken away from your everyday routine from going to school and being a being a kid, um, but ultimately it was very fearful. You know, it was it was I was being withheld from my you know freedom. I knew that was it was an unjust incarceration um, but you know guys who I met there were guys who had who had, were ranging from a number of different crimes um, the staff there were very wonderful you know they were I they met, were they were you know they were in Central Juvenile Hall is where I first met Father Greg Boyle ah yes yeah Father, we did a program with Father Greg yeah, back, great back, man. yeah he's a wonderful man back in 1991 he would um, he would go there every other every other week so twice a month he would be there giving mass and um, it, it was, it's nice to just even remember some of his sermons. Mm. Yeah. We're, we're going to come back, um, Frankie, and, and I, we're going to take a little break now, but I want to get a little bit into you move from Juvie Hall to the adult prison, uh, and you're moving into an experience of, in many ways, hopeless mm -hmm. situation of getting out from something that you had not done. And I want to hear a little bit about where does the Lord fit into all of this? And how does Jesus, and I'm thinking of Jesus standing in front of Pilate and being falsely accused mm -hmm. and then, then killed, um, was there a relationship that you found between Christ as the source of support in what seems like an overwhelmingly difficult situation? Mm -hmm. Stay tuned, we're gonna come back and God bless you. Listen to this message, please. I don't know about you, but I believe in prayer. I really believe that the Lord hears us when we pray, and I believe that miracles can happen when you pray, and those miracles might not happen if you don't pray. I know you share that faith with me. Well, in my excitement about prayer, I've prepared something for you. It's called pocket prayers. Look, look how small it is. It's filled with wonderful Catholic prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Creed, um, the Mysteries of the Rosary, the Acts of Contrition, the Morning and Evening Prayers, and oh, there's some special Catholic prayers that I know you love, like the Memorare. But it's also filled with very special prayers, prayers that are going to touch you day in and day out in your life. One of the prayers that I like very much is the prayer for healing. Ah and even a prayer in financial problems. And oh my, we're struggling with that now. There's even a prayer for uh, getting ready to drive. Please, I would love for you to have this for your donation of $1 or more. This is something that you can put in your pocket, you can put in your purse and pull out at all kinds of exciting times or even waiting times. It's something you can use at work, you can use it at home, you can use it at school when you're waiting for a bus or you're waiting for the doctor. And I'd love you to get this and perhaps pass it on to a friend, a wonderful gift. Please, would you contact us? You can do it by email, by letter. Please pick up the phone and also contact us through the web page. Remember, Pocket Prayers, a powerful way of making prayer alive and God coming into your life with blessings and peace. Thank you. Please, let me hear from you. Frankie, you, you mentioned the fact that you were uh, kind of numb, if you will, or kind of closed off because it was just so overwhelming. 
the numbness has to kind of wear off after a while, doesn't it, though? And, and uh, now when you move from juvie hall to the, uh, to the adult men's prison, right. all of a sudden you're living in a completely different world from the security of, of your home in Maywood and Linwood to a lot of rough people and a people with different values. And it, it, it was hard. It was, so, so now it went from having to worry about, literally having to worry about my day-to-day, -day, you know, the case that was pending. Yes to having to now interact with, you know, on a social level with, with individuals who are all strangers, um, the, the potential of, of, of violence occurring at any moment. So it, it, it's, it's unfortunate that what was weighing on me more was staying alive than, than the case. The case seemed to be like no big deal compared to what was going on there in the county jail. Wow. So soon after that, I was convicted and I was sent away to the California Youth Authority where I spent about five years um, uh, YTS, which is um, here in Ontario, California, um, it, it's you know it's, it's a training school. So I, I was educated there, and, and it's it's another world. You know, it's it's not only it's not only you know me having to worry about my emotional state of being, you know, the fact that I've been wrongfully in prison, the fact that you know I have a son who's now without me. There's a family who misses. Well, you me. got a, You got a son. I have a 20 year old son. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So, so life is occurring, but at the same time, this terrible problem just looms there, which is, I'm not supposed to be here. Two questions I want to ask. I, I want to ask you about um, what kind of support were you getting from your family and friends, sure. and also from the church? And then the, the second question is concerning how did Jesus enter into this in terms of as a source of and the Bible and, and a, as a source of help? Sure, to this sure. terrible problem. Number one, tell me about your family and, and the support that you received. Sure. So I have an amazing family. That's, 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 I have to mention that you know, off the top here. And, and friends. I have a great uh, circle of friends. However, it was very hard for them to comprehend kind of like what to do next. Mm. I mean, in 1991, there was no Innocence Projects throughout the country. It was just individual what, attorneys. What is that, Innocence Projects? So Innocence Projects are these clinics that each state at this point has. And these clinics are, are, are designed to um, mediate or, or investigate claims of innocence. So back in those, in those, in the early 90s, those clinics weren't around, at least not in California. So it was pretty much, um, you have to find a, an attorney who would be willing to just take your claim and look into it. So it, it put everyone in, in a standstill of like, They're not quite sure what, what do you do. do with this kind of case? You know, it was hard. Um, but, but emotionally and spiritually they were there for me, which, which I think that was, was very critical in my, um, I mean, the, 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 the odyssey of 20 years in prison, I think without them it would have been very hard. Tell me a little bit about uh, <clears throat> Father Greg Boyle. You, you mentioned sure. Father Greg. Was there, a, was there a source of spiritual direction that you were able to get of uh, chaplains and whatnot coming to you and helping? There definitely was. So I, I think at every point, every, every institution I'd, I was um, housed, there was, there was either volunteers or the priest or someone being able to just, who was present enough to, um, nurture your soul and just take time and just listen to you and, and, um, and make you feel alive is pretty much what it comes down to. And, um, you know, my, my, my upbringing wasn't the best. You know, I come from a divorced family and, and you know, we're very, um, we're, we come from, I come from a poor family. And, um, you know, things were hard. But to, and, and I think I was, I was always starving for, for um, spiritual nourishment along with just some wise words and when I came across Father Boyle there in Central Juvenile Hall, you know, he, he, he filled that void. You know, he was, he was bilingual, he was charismatic, he was, he was just the voice that I needed at that time. Mm. And um, so, you know, I, I saw him just recently and it was nice to be able to thank him for um, planting those seeds that were, that were able to then flourish. Tell me a little bit about the Bible. You, you, you have a wonderful story of Joseph. Tell us about Joseph and how that Bible story was able to help you. Joseph is, is a... a one of many brothers, and it turns out that his father, he's his, he's his father's favorite. It's pretty clear in the book, in the story. And um, at some point, the brothers go off, they were sheep herders, they go off and, and um, they pretty much plotted against Joseph and said, you know what, enough of Joseph, we need to get rid of him. A little and bit of jealousy in there, A little bit of huh? jealousy, you know. Yes. It, it, it describes Joseph as being um, a number of great things, but mainly that his father loved him. Um, and what occurred was that they wanted to kill him. They wanted to do away with Joseph, and they were going to plot and, and get away with him, and, and you know, return back and say the, the, an animal had you know devoured Joseph, and he's no longer with us. 
but instead, I think the brother Reuben said, um, you know, like, let's not kill him. And they were going to throw him into a pit, and eventually they sold him off into, into be a slave. A caravan was going by, and they just sold him off. Um, he ends up in Egypt, and eventually he's, he's Potiphar. Famous Potiphar buys him, purchases um, Joseph, and he becomes like a, a he's house a, slave. He's a slave. He's a slave, you know, and, and it turns out that um, he was a good-looking guy, and Potiphar's wife was very attracted to him and made many advances, and he, he continued to, to um, reject them to the point that she falsely accused him of, I suppose, raping her, or, you know, seducing, seducing her, her yeah, maybe yeah. a better word there, and he's sent away to prison. And I think he spent about maybe 12 years, I think it's what the Bible says. And really? Oh, I didn't realize that, 12 years. Yeah, the one I read, the version I read, yeah, I think no, it said no, 12 years. Yeah, no, no, that's real, yes, yeah, sure, yes. <laughs> Um, but eventually he, he became very um, influential there with, in the prison, and he just never lost hope, he never lost faith. Um, ultimately, he, uh, because he was a dream interpreter, um, um, the Pharaoh heard about him and, and through a messenger, through a baker and a butcher and so on. So he, he regained his freedom and he was able to then um, forgive his brothers and so on. But what gave me strength was the fact that um, here was a story of injustice. Here's a story of a man who was able to persevere no matter what. Tell me a little bit, Frankie, about um, forgiveness. How do, how do you deal with forgiveness for people who, who have taken 20 years of your life from you? Right. It turns out that it, it was, I realized that it was more about I needed to forgive them. You know, they're human. Um, they made a mistake. They, they you know, whatever, whatever I needed to use, you know, whatever words I used to justify it. But, you know, the Bible also teaches us, all of us to be forgiving. You know, so I think that it's, it's, it goes to the core of the message of, you know, what Jesus is here to remind us of, that we should love one another and none of us are perfect. And I think just for my own personal well-being, um, I realize that living your life with that sort of mindset of, you know, hating others and, and being resentment and, and not forgiving, it, it can literally um, destroy your life. So I, I, I figured, you know what, this is, I, I, I'm suffering enough. You know, and, and and thank God I was able to um, connect those dots and realize that this is not what I should be doing. Instead, I, I forgive them all, and I feel good about that. I'm, there's no there's no other way around it. You know, I, it's it's something I've chosen chosen to do. What would you say to to people that are watching the television program about the importance of letting a, a Christian commitment also involve getting involved with people that are in jail? I would highly recommend it. Um, you know, I, I have many memories of, maybe some of the most precious memories that I have during my incarceration were those volunteers and people who did it for, you know, whatever reason they did it for, they were there. They were, there. They were taking time out of their lives to be present. And, you know, for, for someone who's in prison or juvenile hall prison, does it matter, just incarcerated, you know, you're, you're emotionally deprived from the world. And what, what's, what's amazing is that I think that time the, the person is so hungry for some love and, and attention and wisdom, mainly for some words of advice. And it's like the perfect breeding ground or the perfect um, um, set of circumstances for someone to absorb a message, um, you know, kind words and so on that can literally change their lives as, as it, I'm, I mean, I'm living proof of it. Stay tuned. We're going to find out what was the miracle that happened <laughs> after 20 years to allow you to be free. Please stay tuned. You and I believe in prayer. Prayer changes everything. And I've prepared a wonderful little gift for you to help with your prayer. It's called pocket prayers. It's, it's wonderful. It can fit in your, in your purse, in your pocket. And you can pull it out and pray the Catholic prayers that we know, but also some of the special prayers that I've composed that I hope will allow God to come into your life with greater force. Please. Remember the prayer for healing, oh, financial help, and remember also a, a simple prayer that is going to be said before you start driving. Remember, this can be used at work, at home, at school, while you're waiting for a bus or waiting for a doctor. It's also a wonderful gift to share with people you love. For only one dollar or more, you can have this. Please contact us, let me know that you're part of this ministry in a great way. God bless you. After so many years, and the road is, is really 
hopeless. Right. You found you found the ability to get me at free. Who who was working for you, sure. and how did it happen? And I was doing everything possible. I was writing letters. I was making calls. I was just making noise, trying to get some attention. But I can recall very clearly that um, during one of my prayers, um, the message was, you know, ask, ask Tony Carter, who a woman I worked for, to help you. And it seemed kind of childish. And, oh, you know, I'm going to leave her alone. She was about to retire. She was a teacher at Folsom, and I worked for her. So I said, you know what, let me just act on this. So I said, Tony, you know, you're, you're retiring. You know, if you happen to meet a lawyer or someone who might be interested in my case, like, please pass it along. So she says, sure, you know, so, so she's now, she, she leaves the prison and about six months to a year go by and she happens to be at this um, book, book club or some kind of gathering and it turns out that a woman by the name of Ellen Eggers mentions that she's an attorney and it triggers in her mind, oh, here's my moment. So she shares my story with this attorney who's from Sacramento. Soon after, the attorney comes visits me and soon after that, um, the, the law firm Morrison Forster um, the Northern California Innocence Project and a number of other attorneys became my, my, attorney, my attorneys and soon after, it took them about four or five years, it, it took them that long which is, I mean looking back now, it could, take, it, it could take 10 years but the fact that they were able to find the evidence that would prove my innocence um, was is just amazing. So um, March of, this year, of last year, 2000, 2011, um, here in Los Angeles there was a hearing and um, ultimately the district attorney's office conceded you know, we had proved our case, and they pretty much said, you know what, Your Honor, Mr. Carrillo has, has, has proven his innocence, and he should be freed. So it was, it was a great day. It kind of ties into what we're talking about with praying with people. Right. There's all kind of people that are caught up in prisons, maybe not with walls and bars, but maybe some of the sin and the struggle that people are going through, and they want to be free. Absolutely. <laughs> And I think that Jesus can be the answer to that. I agree. The forgiveness and the, the you know, we we get all kind of people that are writing. Look at here. Here's from here's Maria from Arizona. You know, um, she's looking for protection and, and and peace in her life. And here's from Missouri. Here's I I pray that my family will draw closer to Jesus. You know, Stephanie. And here's Louisiana. My friends have Jesus in their all, all that my friends will have Jesus in their heart always. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Would, would lay your hands sure. on there, would you? And let, I, 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 I think your prayers are going to be powerful, <laughs> Frankie. Let, let's pray. Lord, Frankie and I are coming to you with the confidence that you love us and you watch over us. All of these people that have written in and have contacted us, and even with regard to the iPhone with the iGod app, are getting in touch and asking for prayers. Please, Lord, bless them. Bring about miracles. Here's a miracle with Frankie. This can happen to you. Jesus, love for you always.